All right, um, I'm going to start then. Uh, Tom, Tom Fletcher, Ambassador Tom Fletcher, you are an old friend, uh, meaning that I've known you for some time, not actually old. Um, you're a colleague as we serve on the Emirates Diplomatic Academy board. Uh, you are a fellow panelist and we've met on, on uh, panels in uh, Dubai in particular uh, and in Abu Dhabi on, online on Zoom. And you know, you've, um, we have sparred in person and on Zoom and you didn't come out of those uh, sessions too well, but nevertheless, I'm gonna give you another chance today. So we welcome you. Most notably, at least uh, the way I look at you, most notably you were the UK ambassador to Lebanon and you famously left behind a letter to the Lebanese people. And it's wonderful to see that they took your advice on all of those points. You left diplomacy as a result, I believe, of that. <laughs> uh, and you've been teaching at NYU, both in New York uh, and in Abu Dhabi, and you set up a foundation uh, or co-founded uh, a foundation called Foundation for Opportunity, which sounds very enterprising and it's, uh, something that I'd like to look into later. And you are exceptionally lucky and privileged you are heading to Hartford College, uh, Oxford University to become the principal, uh, presumably in September. That's right, September the 1st. Well, that's very, very exciting. I'm, I'm really uh, excited that I'm gonna be invited to high table to have dinner with you. Uh, and lastly, and most importantly, you are promising the world a, a murder novel, uh, which I hope you'll be able to tell us about later on. Um, to, to start with, you know, the series that we've done, we've had a, a bunch of very interesting people. So, you know, you've got to really make an effort to uh, punch high. Yeah? Um, it's uh, the future of diplomacy, a future of basically of foreign affairs in the light of COVID. And you know, just to start off, I haven't actually met anybody new in person since late February. Uh, and I'm just wondering from our perspective, a slightly older diplomat, what should, what should young diplomats uh, be thinking at this point? They're going to have to be able to, essentially, unless, you know, the world uh, goes back to normal, they're going to have to be able to develop their relationships with people, with fellow diplomats and, uh, and, and sort of civil servants in an environment which is purely digital. How's that going to work? And, and, and do you foresee it? I mean, Zoom is, is, is great, but it's not the best way of um, developing bonds and, and, and sort of, you know, sharing an evening out together. Well, I hope you're saying that in an hour and a half, uh, Omar. But, um, we, <laughs> I, I, we've had great fun on these, on these panels over the last uh, few years. I think the first one we did together was at the Dubai Literary Festival. Yes. And at the end of it, you said to me, I don't know who will get fired first. Uh, after yeah, it was that. a race to the bottom, I think, yeah. We, we brought out the worst in each other. So I'm glad that we're, we're now four years older and, and, uh, and wiser. Uh, <laughs> than then. Um, one thing, by the way, talking of, uh, of Zoom calls, one uh, peril of Zoom calls that people keep telling me is that it's very difficult when you have your own picture in the, in the top corner because you, you find yourself glancing up at yourself the whole time. God and forbid. I'm, that was always very difficult for you in real life. So it's even harder now uh, on, <laughs> online. So I hope that won't be too much of a problem. Well, may I say that, that the, the screen is not as sensitive as the mirror, which keeps cracking, as you know. You know, and, and also, I, I enjoy your boxing metaphors just then, but you know, I, I was actually a boxer. Um, it doesn't show it. My, my, my first diplomatic posting, uh, I had a, a boxing match against the mayor of Nairobi, a guy called Joe Akech, who was the former mayor, uh, the for, a former heavyweight champion. And uh, he <laughs> told me that I'll come out of retirement and we'll raise money for this orphanage if you'll fight me. And I thought, well, it's quite difficult to say no to that, but I thought it just wouldn't happen. Yeah. And I was coming home from a, an overseas break, and at the airport, they had all these placards up. And I was like, there must be a kind of big, Omar Gabash must be arriving. Some, some <laughs> must be turning up. I looked out of the window, and, and the placard said, Fletcher goes home on a stretcher. <laughs> and this was That's excellent. Uh, and I, I think I can claim I'm one of the few uh, diplomats who's actually turned to box. It didn't last very long. My, my motto was, uh, float like a bee, sting like a butterfly. <laughs> yes. It was a very, uh, successful uh, fight. Um, anyway, really looking forward to, uh, to chatting today, and I've really enjoyed the, the series so far, and congratulations on it. It's been one of the, the highlights of lockdown. It's almost made uh, lockdown worthwhile. Um, because as Thank you, you said, it, this, is, this is changing everything, and, and the, the prospects for young diplomats are being transformed as fast as the prospects for, for any uh, profession. I would still say pandemic or no pandemic, Zoom or no Zoom, uh, AI or no AI, this is still 
the last profession to be automated. Really? Uh, yes. I still genuinely believe that that last three feet, that the, the empathy and emotional intelligence that the great diplomats have uh, is not something that's easy to replicate. As you say, you, you, can't, you can't create that online. Yeah. I agree with you. There's, there's, there is a gulf, I think, in the connection you feel on a Zoom call, for example, with someone with whom you already have a rapport, mm -hmm. it's much easier to adapt compared to someone that you've never met before. But maybe those young diplomats will show us the way. You know, I look at my, my 13 year old son at the moment is upstairs organizing an, on, an online quiz for his mates, then they're gonna have, then go and do Netflix party. You know, so much of their relationship, so much of their existence is already online. Yeah. Yeah. It may be those young diplomats that can show us how to do that. And, and right. they'll have to ask because, you know, we have to understand that for the last 20, 30 years, we've thought the answer to every global problem was an international conference. Mm -hmm. you know, that is the pinnacle of diplomacy. That's what we well, do. Because we love to travel, right? Well, you know, think of Hillary, Hillary Clinton used to boast about how much traveling she was doing, how many air miles she had. Yeah. You know, clearly, even before the pandemic, we were starting to realize the damage that was doing to the climate. So that, that all has to change. And so mm -hmm. I, I, I want to encourage those younger diplomats to, to, to show us the way. Oh, so you've, <laughs> so you've thrown it right back onto them. <laughs> yes. Well, no, I'm, I think of you as a younger diplomat as well. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, out there inventing new ways to communicate with people. Uh, re related to, to that, I'm, I'm just wondering also, if you look at certain diplomats, I mean, in, to, to be a diplomat, you don't actually have to be working in a, in a Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I mean, you can be a national security, uh, a John Bolton type guy. Uh, or you could be Hillary Clinton, or you could be, for example, the Iranian foreign minister. There is a certain amount of showmanship, a certain amount of posturing. Uh, there is theater uh, related to diplomacy. How, how important do you think that is uh, versus you know, the, the, the nuts and bolts of getting uh, you know, things done between countries, sorting out um, evacuation of, of uh, patients and so on? So incidentally, I'm actually more um, heretical than that. I think that anyone can be a diplomat. I think yeah. um, this isn't brain surgery. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not like practicing the law. We don't need, you know, there, 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 there aren't a certain set of conventions and, and a certain amount of knowledge that you have to have in order to be yeah. diplomatic, to practice diplomacy. Some of the greatest diplomats I observed were in Northern Ireland working on the peace process, community, yeah. or, in, or in Lebanon. You mentioned Lebanon, you know, working between the different uh political groupings there you know i think you can be a diplomat in your ordinary life and actually the challenge for us now is to encourage those sorts of diplomatic skills you know in education yeah. we, we call them 21st century skills like yeah. empathy, you know we diplomats call that diplomacy and yeah. a lot of it is actually about encouraging those skills in in the curriculum i think mm -hmm. it's a reason why i'm very comfortable working in education now and staying in education uh, for, the, for the next 10 years um, because education is actually upstream diplomacy uh, yeah. and so I think anyone can be a diplomat on the on the showmanship in the theater look there's a certain panache that comes with running a good twitter handle uh, for yeah. example there's a certain flair and you mentioned some of those who have it um, with you know that quick response diplomacy the, the very yeah. clear, the very clever comeback to a trump yeah. tweet uh, yeah. <laughs> Is a classic example uh, of that but there has to be some substance behind all of that and often the, the foreign ministry can provide a lot of that you know the, the iceberg beneath the surface mm -hmm. i quite panache the flare you know in lebanon i was often accused of, of pulling stunts you know i exchanged places with uh, an ethiopian uh, housemate to highlight the uh, the mistreatment of domestic workers uh, yeah. gave blood outside the iranian embassy when when it was bombed you know, but they were, I, I, I say these are stunts with purpose. They're not just yeah. gimmick. I'm not just trying to get likes. I'm not just, you know, I'm not trying to be a comedian. Or an, yeah. or an, you know, other people are way better. If you want entertainment or comedy, don't look to diplomats. Um, <laughs> you know, so I do think there's showmanship to it, but that has to be for a purpose. It yeah. can't just be for uh, attention. And look, there has always been a certain amount of theater to diplomacy. If you think about some of those great moments, think of the Congress of Vienna, you know, these, mm. these great diplomatic moments or the mm. early Venetian city-states sending out these ambassadors with their own banks, you know, and all that kind of the paraphernalia of oh, the... That, that would have been fun. You know, that's, 
that's theatre in its time. Yeah. You know, even I used to at times feel that a large part of my role as an ambassador was actually the theatre, and not just the online. Really? Yeah. You know, when a bomb goes off, the way you hold yourself, the the way you speak, uh, the very careful choice of words. You know, when you're celebrating someone's achievement or yeah. sharing a sad moment, a lot of that is is about the theatre and the projection, but also. Yeah. You know, the way you walk into a national day, you know, there's, Lebanon was a fairly competitive diplomatic environment. And, you know, the, even the way you walked into a national day, I used to think was important. Really? Huh. Can you give me some examples? Because, you know, I, I witnessed uh, 10 years of national days uh, when I served in Russia. Um, and they were there were certainly entrances made, <laughs> but none that I can really talk about. <laughs> <laughs> they could be pretty dismal. I mean, I think... Yeah, <laughs> you do. I mean, I hate national days. I have to be honest, and I can say that now as a as a recovering diplomat. Um, I, I used to find them very hard work. I used to try and ensure that our national days felt very, very different to the classic ones. I, you know, yeah. I, I held them in a nightclub in in Beirut, uh, and so on. And you know, we wanted them to feel exciting and and, and to yeah. be about century Britain and modern Britain, and not to feel stale. You know that you know, warm glass of whatever it was and a kind of fairly uh, frightening looking uh, canopy. Um, but no, there were times when, I mean, one, one classic example in Lebanon actually was arriving at the, it was the, the Iranian National Day, sorry to linger on Iran again. Um, I hope that doesn't cause any trouble, but... Um, We've got a hard, hard burn here, but yeah, it's okay. <laughs> okay it's okay, I'll, I'll be careful. Um, but I, at that one, we hadn't had relations with them for four years. Oh, wow. The first time I'd been for five, because we had a ridiculous rule at the time that you couldn't talk to people you disagreed with. A, a, yeah. a rule written by a very stupid young advisor in number 10 uh, called Tom Fletcher. Uh, no, you didn't say that, did you? It wasn't, I, my rule was we, we shouldn't talk to people with blood on their hands in the Middle East, uh, which when I got to Beirut, I realized ruled out almost everyone. I, I find it interesting that you qualify that statement with in the Middle East. Uh, so, and elsewhere is okay? Uh, is this okay. another question? At Double time, standards of the West, as usual. <laughs> I was self aware in those days, and so um, we, we didn't okay. recognize yeah. the obvious irony uh, of that. Now, I'm exaggerating a bit, but we, we had no relations with Iran at that time, and then suddenly yeah. had permission to go to this national day after this you know, long hiatus. And I, and I walked in, I was very, very conscious uh, yeah. of how that was perceived that moment. And I actually I walked around the room five times, about half an hour. You know, you know the way you do it at National Day when you're a bit looking for someone interesting to talk to. In the and region, we call this circumambulation. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Or, or, or looking for the exit. And, <laughs> and no one spoke to me. Yes. And oh, hour, really? And I thought, I'm not leaving. You know, I, I'm going to make a point of having made the effort. Yeah. And after half an hour, the Iranian um, cultural counselor, I think he was claiming to be, uh, came up to me and said, um, Thank you for staying this long. We didn't think you'd stay this long. And then I was mobbed. Oh, and that's and I was by the young, younger diplomats and the young students and so on. And so that was theatre. I mean, nothing I said that evening uh, made any impression on anyone, as usual. But the, the theatre of that moment was important. Well, here, here's a, a question, because I, I think for some younger diplomats, I find that they, um, they have this great desire to represent the country. They know what's right. They know what's wrong. They know what they think should be done. And then they get an instruction that sort of goes against that. And then all of a sudden, they find themselves in a position where they, they're made to realize you, as a diplomat, do not make foreign policy up as you go along. You are actually representing a policy. And that's kind of a there's a kind of a shock to the system when you all of a sudden. So how do you how do you perform stunts in a way, uh, without without changing the tone of UK representation? It's a it's a brilliant question. I I mean, I would always say to diplomats who work with me, we don't have to be boring, just because the subject sometimes requires us to say more boring yeah. things. We choose our language carefully. Mm. It doesn't mean that we need to be boring. I. I I would still hope that the diplomats who work in our embassies are people you want to invite out to dinner. You know, they've got a bit of gossip or a bit of latest news, yeah. they know how to trade uh, information. But I think yeah. it's maybe easier for you and I to say that. And the reason I, I say that is, you know, I went out to Beirut, I had a certain amount of, of cover. I'd, I'd yeah. worked in three, three prime ministers. People yeah. assumed I had more authority than I actually had. Yeah. And that I could 
I was allowed to get away with a bit more, to, to take some risks. I was yeah. also, you know, like I, was, I, I also went out as a relatively young ambassador as well. And so people, I think people expected me to, to experiment a little bit. Um, it's much e easier when you know where the line is and you, you, but maybe more importantly, you know when you can push the line a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah. And that's right. where the really diplomacy is and that slightly gray area where we push the lines and, you know, where the trade-offs actually start to happen. I think, yeah. but I think a lot depends for younger diplomats on, on, on getting alongside and learning from, from the people that they can see doing that and, and admire for doing it. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a, a certain level of risk taking that you've got to take um, with a gut feeling for what is acceptable and what isn't, what will be taken well and what won't, right? Hmm. So what's the biggest risk you've ever taken in diplomacy? Biggest risk I've ever taken in diplomacy? Uh, no, you know, I was always very, um, I was always very, very conscious that I was representing something. Uh, I may have taken sort of, you know, um, personal risks um, in the sense of maybe consuming the wrong thing, eating the wrong thing, going on the wrong kind of, you know, um, uh, to the wrong house, um, stuff like that, you know. But you've got to, you have to expose yourself in a certain way as a diplomat. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of the, what is it called? The arrowhead, yeah? You're, you're out there. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's very complimentary, huh? Arrowhead. I had a great guy who, uh, who'd been the head of special forces, head of the SAS. Yeah. And now and again, he'd turn up in Beirut, normally when I was feeling particularly despondent about things. And he'd normally come over the wall. He'd get past my bodyguards and he'd just be <laughs> sat and he'd, and he'd pop up and he'd say, Ambassador, proceed until apprehended. <laughs> and I was, I was, you know, it, it doesn't always work. And, and sometimes you have to apologize after the fact. But I think, I think we do need our diplomats to proceed until apprehended, to, to take a few of those risks. Um, but never to forget ultimately what you know who they work for yeah and there's a kind of um a, the, the very powerful force called bureaucracy and 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 the desire to show that you can follow rules uh and on the other hand i never felt that desire <laughs> <laughs> maybe not a desire to follow rules a desire to show that you're following the rules uh, because that gives you a sense of power you can throw stones at those who uh, uh deviate from the rules somewhat yeah? So you've got two different kind of personalities within organizations, the risk takers who are ready to be kicked out and those who actually want to stay for life in the organization. I just wonder who has the longer line. Well, I mean, look, I mean, that's maybe that's something that you and I, an experience we share and that we, we both wrote books, which are ultimately about diplomacy and about our love for diplomacy. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it's brought uh, and yet to, to, to write those books, you sometimes have to leave diplomacy. Uh, you know, yeah, promote, yeah. I, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure that your, your colleagues are too polite to say that this, and, and I hope mine are, are too, but we probably both have colleagues who disapprove of that choice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And they're not shy either, I think. Um, but, that, but that's fine. Uh, and, and I think you, you need to develop a, a thick skin anyway, just to get on in life. Um, so, and, you know, they make choices that I don't necessarily approve of, and they, they operate in ways that... Um, you got, think, me, you got me thinking that, hmm? I think that, just on that point, I think it would be horrendous if, if all diplomats looked and thought the same way. You know, I think one yeah. of the wonderful things about, um, you know, when I look around the, uh, the young Emirati diplomats now, when I look around, you know, the, the current group of, of UK ambassadors is, hmm. is much greater diversity uh, than yeah. we have. When I started in the Foreign Office, the main diversity was, did the white men have blue shirts or white shirts? You know, did we wear uh, glasses or no glasses? You know, yeah. And now it's much, much more representative of, uh, of society and, and way better for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So glasses for everybody then, eh? All right. Okay. Um, I think you, you uh, introduced me actually to one of our uh, speakers, Caspar uh, Klinja, um, who was a uh, tech ambassador for Denmark and then uh, jump ship has become a uh, tech ambassador for Microsoft to the European Union. Um, so could you, could you talk a little about the rise of non-state actors, uh, you know, sort of positively regarded non-state actors, whether they're uh, movements like Black Lives Matter or, um, you know, sort of more uh, official NGOs uh, and specifically tech companies that have become, you know, 
massively influential, penetrating countries and societies right across across the globe. How should diplomats now be dealing with these um, different powers? It's a really it's a really key question um, uh, because, of course, you know, if you, again, if you go back to the example of Congress of Vienna, uh, no one was turning up at that diplomatic conference saying, "Let's now hear hear from a corporation," or "I wonder if we can hear from the youth representative," or you know, an NGO voice. You know, the and yet now, if you have a conference on climate change or artificial intelligence, you need all those voices in the room. Otherwise, it's pointless having the, the conversation. I'm, I'm a big fan uh, of Casper and the work he did as the, as the tech ambassador. When he began, I, I was quite involved in, in the early conversations about that role. Yeah. And I speculated with him that, I mean, two things, which I hope he won't mind me uh, sharing. One was, I suggested that... Uh, his colleagues would all say how much they supported the idea, but very few of them would actually want him to succeed. And that yeah. wasn't a reflection on Denmark, it was a reflection more on, uh, on the craft. Mm. Um, and secondly, that probably after four or five years, he'd be poached by Apple, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, um, or, or yeah. Google. Uh, and it'd be, you know, poacher turned gamekeeper, or gamekeeper turned poacher. It was a really good experiment in actually the new, the new front lines of diplomacy. Sure. Many of the difficult conversations now are between governments and tech companies. Yeah. Look at the relationship that uh, the EU has with Mark Zuckerberg, for example. You know, the, the efforts of a British parliamentary committee to summon Mark Zuckerberg, he sent his underling. They then went to Silicon Valley, he sent another underling. You know, th these are power struggle, struggles that yeah. we would recognize. You know, this is like, who do you sit next to at National Day? You know, you know whose majlis do you get invited to? How long do you stay? It's very similar uh, power dynamics. So we have we've got to get much better at mapping that 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 power um, ecosystem, yeah. which we're usually not very good at, because diplomats are great at thinking who are the twenty ministers I need to get to know, or the twenty yeah. diplomats, twenty businessmen. Um, we're not great at looking at that wider ecosystem and thinking, well, who else really changes mm -hmm. the conversation. Uh, and you mentioned some of them who do. I mean, the, we, so we've got to have a much better conversation with the tech companies. It's why we formed the Global Tech Panel, uh, which is co-chaired by Brad Smith of Microsoft and the EU Vice President, and brings together these voices from, from yeah. government tech to talk about the challenges, opportunities of AI, lethal autonomous weapon systems, uh, mm -hmm. you know, facial recognition, big issues yeah. around the diplomats. But you mentioned some of the others. So NGOs, I think, Certainly in, in the UK, in the West, mm -hmm. NGOs a big part of diplomacy for probably 15 to 20 years. Yeah. Uh, the summit, 2006, make poverty history, drop yep. the debt campaigns. These were huge moments that were driven by uh, campaigners and NGOs. And yep. diplomats had to really scramble to catch up with understanding yep. those movements. And actually with understanding the way that our political leaders were able to to use those dynamics outside the conference room to influence what was going on in the conference room. You know, yeah. we would do concerts, remember, at the time, and like Live Aid and so on, deliberately designed to put pressure on the leaders of the G8. You know, yeah. with people turning up in big Putin masks or, uh, or George Bush masks and, and so yeah. on. Yeah. That, so they've been very much, NGOs have been very much a part of uh, our life since then. You know, yeah. business has obviously been, been, you know, hand in hand with diplomacy since the very beginning since those first Venetian ambassadors went out with their banks, you know, they were often businesses first and, and yeah. diplomats second. But I fear that in the last, certainly in the last couple of decades, diplomats haven't always understood the needs of, of business. They haven't understood exactly where they most add value to businesses. Yeah. And as you started out by saying, many diplomats now have, many businesses have their own diplomats. Yeah, their own exactly. Diplomacy. When, when Google came to Beirut, they stop the traffic. You know, people that I would have to work for a week to get a meeting with for my visiting yeah. minister dropped everything to see the assistant deputy vice chairman for something uh, <laughs> just to have very the important person, if I remember correctly. <laughs> exactly, um, yeah. he's doing well now, and yeah. um, you know, so it's a, it's a dynamic we really uh, have to understand. But one final reflection on this is that I think we all assume, and diplomats maybe yeah. more than me, that power is elsewhere. We always think someone else is exercising power. And there's this mm. great line, power is, is much harder to get now, much harder to use, and then much easier to lose. Mm -hmm. And I think that's 
one of the few things that Barack Obama and Donald Trump would agree on, that exercising power is, is getting harder and harder. And diplomats feel that we don't necessarily have it anymore. We haven't always analyzed really where it's gone. You know, it reminds me of um, um, a member of parliament in the UK I was speaking to who said, we in parliament have no power, it's, all, it's with the judges. And I was like, well, really? All right, okay. Uh, so that, yeah, that, that discussion ended fairly quickly and they headed off to the law courts. <laughs> <laughs> but there'll still be, you know, that will still be, coming back to your, your point about younger diplomats come, getting into yeah. it, it's the fun, you know, the... Yeah. Well, that's the battle for us. You, you arrive in a new posting, you think, well, who do I actually need to know here? How do yeah. I build that influence, those relationships? And where's the transaction? You know, people think of diplomacy as this slightly vanilla, we have to be diplomatic, which means we yeah. have to be everyone. And, you know, yeah. Always conceding points. And political leaders tend to think diplomats are incredibly feeble, that, you know, we'll just give yeah. away every negotiation and yeah. that we need to actually articulate our own country's views. You know, there was an American Secretary of State who used to spin the globe and he'd say to his ambassadors, which is your country? And they'd always <laughs> hit the country they were being posted to and not America. Oh, uh, this, <laughs> oh no. Uh, and, but actually, the fun of diplomacy is the transaction. You know, yeah. That, that, yeah, that's the kind of the, the grit in the oyster. So if I can just sort of contribute a little from my side, one of the things I found uh, fascinating about being a diplomat in the field was all of the philosophical questions, you know, that you had to answer. You had clear institutions with, you know, sort of designated people that you would, you would immediately think were the right partner to speak to. And then you had the powers behind all of these organizations. And you had this par these parallel structures and you never knew how far back you had to go to get something done. And turning around and coming back home with, you know, having understood who it was outside, you would then find exactly the same thing back, back at home. So actually being a diplomat is being a diplomat is mapping out power structures, both at home and in the country that you're represented uh, in, or you're, you're, being, um, you're, you're working in. I don't know if you felt that. I mean, Lebanon must have been a real uh, kind of a... I think, I think you're, only, you're only effective and you only get influence in the country that you're posted to if you can demonstrate you have influence back in your own capital. It, yeah. you know, yeah. why, especially now you can Zoom direct with your counterpart, why bother going through the uh, ambassador? But if you think yeah. the ambassador is the one who can make the conversation more productive, yeah, a sweet spot uh, of, um, of influence. An odd thing for me, I've never understood this, I don't know how it is for you guys here in, in the UAE. Diplomats are quite good at negotiating overseas. You know, we think that's mm. one of the things we love. When, when we come back to our capital, yeah, is a terrible at negotiating with the other departments. Yeah, yeah. And you know, so if you walked into a negotiation between the Treasury and the Foreign Office in the UK, yeah, and I say this with utter love for my former colleagues in the Foreign Office, you know, I'll be on the last one to read into them. Um, but the diplomats tend, uh, tend to be getting smashed around by the Treasury officials, who yeah. are quite involved in the fact that these master negotiators are actually not as good as uh, as they. Uh, they're depicted to be. Um, so I, I think, by the way, I think there's a lot we can learn actually from, from those times when we're posting, you know, even in, in Moscow, there's a huge amount you must have learned there about yeah. power dynamics that... Yeah, absolutely. No, it, it's incredibly fascinating. And, you know, I don't regret a single minute of my time there. Um, but, I, but I really do think that it, it raises some very deep philosophical questions about, you know, division of power, how bureaucracies work, um, you know, sort of the meaning of a person's a function, um, and you know, just just mapping your way through all of this is 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 fascinating. Uh, the labyrinth. Would you like to see the UAE become more like Moscow or more like London in the way that it uh, that power is distributed? Uh, I I'm not even sure that London is any different from Moscow in, in the way power is distributed. Huh? Well, which, which brings up actually a, a, another point, which is. Uh, I think, was it, did Tony Blair start it or, or was it Cameron? The, the, the whole idea of uh, uh, armchair diplomacy. Um, or was it armchair diplomacy or sofa diplomacy? So, so in Tony Blair's number 10, particularly in the run up to the Iraq war, the, yeah. it was, a lot of people would claim that it was sofa diplomacy, that there was a small group of advisors yeah. around the prime minister who were making the real decisions. You know, it, it's one of those things that, 
I always thought was a bit cynical. I think, um, I, I think there is always sofa diplomacy. I think every leader yeah. has people that, and it's a good thing that they, you have into your office and you close the door and, you, and, and they, can, they can tell you when you're getting things wrong. Uh, yeah. I think if it doesn't have that, they'll, they'll make many more mistakes. So I don't think that, in my experience, the Blair number 10 wasn't necessarily any, any that different to other administrations um, uh, in that respect. I, it was in some, in some ways that the, the, the difference between the number 10s I worked for was that the, the, the Blair number 10 was sometimes like a, a, a sort of steeplechase. You know, they, they, mm. they were along and they knew where the, the barriers were and they jumped over and sometimes they fell. Mm. Um, sometimes working in the, in the Gordon Brown number 10 was more like rodeo. You were just trying to stay on, you know, and it was up and much more up and down. Yeah. And often in the David Cameron number 10 was more like Jim Carner. It was a bit more refined and, and um, very polite. Hmm. But there were sofas, they all had sofas, but maybe um, they were just called different things, futons and canapes, depending on the uh, <laughs> population. <laughs> but I, I think the worry about um, sofa foreign affairs or sofa diplomacy um, for a lot of you know, long-term uh, civil servants and, and uh, uh, foreign office staff is that their experience, their knowledge, their um, wisdom is not being taken into account at all. And that, that's, that's the worry. Then, then get on the sofa. That's true. That's true. There's only that much space on a sofa, though. <laughs> you have quite big sofas here in, uh, in uh, Abu Dhabi. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, you, you, have to, you have to get into the room. And actually, the tech helps on this. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that I was really keen on when I did the review of the British Foreign Office was that we have to get the ambassador in the room more often for those conversations. And, you know, now we've seen that that's very possible. You know, if the PM yeah. is... Afghanistan policy, you want your ambassador in, Af in Kabul up on the screen. But, you know, and, you, and you find that actually in those meetings, the ambassador does have a lot of authority and, and influence. True. I'm almost with you, but I'm reading some of the questions. Somebody wants to know the name of the art uh, piece behind you. Oh, yes. So I, I had commissioned that. that I, oh, that's very kind to ask. But um, if you look on Instagram, you, uh, you'll see this one. I, I will have to check that she's happy to be named before I actually name the artist, but she's based on Sadiat. Oh, wow, okay. A wonderful artist. This is actually, the idea was actually to take some of the geometry of diplomacy and the Middle East. And the, and yeah. the, you know, the Alhambra Mosque in there a little bit. Um, and then you've got the fragmentation here. So it's in some ways a visual metaphor for our conversation. <laughs> well, in terms of fragmentation? <laughs> That's just pure, pure luck. I also quite like the blue, by the way, but um, that was the idea of the commission. There's Delightful. A, the logic breaking up. And this is, you know, this, this in a way is a representation of power. You know, power was much more structured. Yes. Much, I have to say much more like a, a British banquet where you know where the rules and the order and where you sit and who speaks when. And now power is much more like a Lebanese meze. You know, it's more chaotic. You don't know when the food's going to arrive. Everyone's standing up, singing, sitting down, you know. And that's, that's exciting. It makes our jobs more interesting. It does. It creates a, a, a ton of opportunities. Yeah. I, I think we should, we should relish that. I agree. Uh, somebody has asked a fantastic question. I, was, uh, I have to tell you, um, Mr. Janabi, that I also wanted to ask that question. Uh, no, anonymous att attendee, uh, AA. Is Google and perhaps the other tech companies, are they the new East India companies of the world? Ooh. What a question. Um, mm. And I, one of the great books uh, I've come across actually j just before lockdown, because yeah. um, Wimple was here for the Hay Festival, is his book on the East India Company. Uh, it's um, a yeah. great book. It's tough reading for a. Uh, for Dal Wimple, no? A, yeah. A Dal Wimple, yeah. East India Company. Um, yeah. um, are they. So the, the, the slight problem we have is that it always takes time for the rules to catch up with the new emperors, uh, mm. for us to strain the emperors. Uh, and, and normally in time, we do develop those rules, but we haven't managed to yet with the tech companies, you know, because they are moving so fast and because their growth has been so dramatic. But also, and this comes back to your earlier thought on, on recruitment, the, the tech companies now are much better able just to hoover up the talent. Yeah. You know, 
we're competing as diplomats we're competing for that talent and you know these companies are pretty make can make a pretty attractive offer right. and so my worry is that it will become harder and harder to 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 restrain them to develop those uh those rules around their activity i think we should be updating uh, the Geneva Convention. I think we should be updating the rules on cybersecurity. I think we should be updating the, the rules on, on human rights internationally, on protection of our uh, mm. data. Um, but it's not very fashionable. It's not very sexy stuff. So here's a, a kind of a follow-on question to that. Um, how, uh, in, how do states like you know, the United States, like China, like Russia, like uh, you know, South Korea, for example, um, how do they look at these tech companies that are emerging from within them. I mean, in a sense, Google is better off not having the rules uh, imposed by the glo global community. Do states stand behind these companies to push out, push the way forward so that they can actually expand? And you say that the, the, the countries can't catch up and, and put the rules down. And part, of the, part of the reason they're growing so quickly is because there aren't any rules. I think it, I mean, it varies from, from country to country. And yeah. I think, uh, of almost every country that I've experienced, they would love to get more tax revenue from uh, from these companies. Yeah, um, but they have, as you say, it tended to be much much too fleet-footed uh, for that. Yeah. I think there's yeah. a huge, you know, everyone wants to attract, in theory, digital talent, um, but then you start to realise that, you know, is it actually are they actually generating jobs? I was in California again just before the lockdown, and one of the big debates out there at the moment is actually are we are we creating or destroying jobs? Are we, are we, are we creating or destroying opportunity overall? Because, yes. for, you know, as we know, for, for everyone who gets the great joy of the gig economy and the on-demand economy and the fact that a pizza can turn up here in five minutes and so on, yeah. there, there are people who are really struggling to support that economy. Yeah, uh, and that's why it, it sorry. Or yeah. having their jobs destroyed. Right, it, kind of wiping out the middle class. Yeah, and... Mm. I mean, again, it comes back to education that, that our kids will have to be much, much more adaptable than we are, much more able to switch between professions. You know, the Fletchers were arrow makers. Uh, that's, that's Warriors. Really, arrow makers, um, originally. And, you know, clearly we're, I'm not making arrows anymore. I'm now opining about diplomacy with, with learned people like yourself. <laughs> but, we, but we probably took centuries to adapt. Uh, from being arrow makers to being, uh, you know, sort of rent um, our, our kids are going to have to adapt three or four times in a, in a lifetime. Yeah. So how, how have you, why did you decide to leave diplomacy and, uh, and yet stay in the Middle East? Um, well, it's a tough, that's a tough question because strangely, in, in writing a book about why diplomacy mattered, I actually had to, to leave diplomacy in order to write and then uh, promoting. Ah, okay. Uh, it's the rules are quite strict, clearly stricter for us uh, than for you, Excellency, um, on on publishing a book. Uh, and so I had to do that from outside. Uh -huh. uh, okay. Um, I have to say the front office were brilliant. I mean, they were very encouraging. There was no there was no bad blood at all, and yeah. they were horrible. But you know, the rules were the uh, were the rules. I think as well. I was, I was spoiled in Lebanon. You know, I, I had what I would still say is the best job in the world. Um, it's, the, it's one of the few countries where they take ambassadors seriously. Uh, and so as an ambassador, you have you know, more influence than you do in, in many places. Mm. Obviously an extraordinary country, but also the issues yeah. we're dealing with were just incredible, you know, yeah. and, lovely and, and exhilarating and energizing. And I worried that I wouldn't be able to recreate that energy uh, you know, just shifting to another country as ambassador again. So I felt I needed some time off that. Um, and I also felt that, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. I did that job quite young. I was 36 when I went out there. Hmm. I couldn't imagine, you know, being an ambassador, you know, every, changing post every four years for another, what, 30 years? You know, that's what, seven or eight posts. Um, so I wanted to refresh and, and try different things. And I was also, this final bit of this answer, I was curious about power. You know, it comes back to your point earlier. I just, I wanted to work out where power was. Yeah, um, yeah it's always interesting. Huh? You know, is it in business? Is yeah. it, I worked with NGOs on campaigns and worked on education. I was trying to find power. And, yeah. and I, 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 finally tonight I found it. 
Well, on, on that subject, I mean, uh, I don't know if you know, but I've had a fairly checkered diplomatic career. I, I was in and out of the uh, um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs a number of times from the age of 22. And um, one of the most interesting things I felt was that I, in, in spite of not having a, a, a stellar career uh, in one place, I learned a lot of little things along the way that actually helped me build up a kind of a mosaic of, of how life is. It gave me more confidence in meeting people who, who are out of my line of work as a diplomat. Uh, and it also uh, gave me a, kind of the, um, the enthusiasm to go out there and, and, and look beyond the traditional uh, structures. I, I think it's so important. Um, I reckon though, and I, I'd, I'd be curious to whether this is the case, when, when someone says to you, what's your profession? What's your craft? Mm. I reckon you say diplomat, maybe with a small d, even in those periods when you weren't a diplomat. Mm. You know, I still write it on the landing, you know, when I land. And it says yeah. what you, you know, rather than try and explain this sort of weird mixture of eclectic <laughs> things now, uh, I, I just write diplomat. And I hope that on my gravestone, it will say diplomat. You know, I think that's the thing that, um, that's my, uh, my calling in life. But I do like the idea that you can move between different professions and different crafts in order to become a better diplomat. I quite yeah. like US model, to be honest, where often you, you go in and you work flat out for five years, then you go into a think tank, maybe you go and join a yeah. business, rotate uh, a bit more. I think that's, I think that's positive. Um, I, so I think it's, a, I think, by the way, I don't think it's held your career back, Omar, too much. Uh, no, I'm, I'm actually very grateful for all the opportunities that uh, I've, I've been given. Um, yeah, and it, ha it hasn't held my career back. It, it's interesting. I, I, would, I actually encourage the idea, even at an institutional level, of saying to people in different professions, whether it's in the oil industry or in, or in government or in diplomacy, take a year out, go somewhere else, or get seconded into a completely different field so you begin to develop an understanding. So, I mean, in our case, energy is a particularly important area. Um, and it would make sense to have some of our diplomats move over into, you know, whether it's the National Oil Company or the Ministry of Energy uh, or the Ministry of the Economy for, for a couple of years to develop an, a, a more rounded understanding. Um, and that, you know, this, this kind of raises a couple more things here. We have, we have a, a professor, William de Sal Salomão from Brazil, who's asking you for your opinion on how, how to build uh, better science diplomacy. And before you answer that, just want to say that we've already had discussions at the, at, at the level of the Emirates Diplomatic Academy around science policy and the importance of getting a kind of critical infrastructure in place um, in the Emirates uh, by partnering across the globe with, you know, sort of food tech companies uh, to, to ensure food security, uh, the science um, uh, aspect, the medical science, uh, tying up with countries that are able to produce tests, for example, for COVID, uh, the masks. Um, you know, we, everybody's been scrambling around the world to figure out how to get these things done. Should these, um, these uh, problems now have an institutionalized response? Should we always have uh, science diplomats out there? Mm. Great question. Um, I think... Um, just, just picking up your point onto comments, I think really, really useful. Um, I also encourage people, but say, don't just do jobs that, that uh, will, will just, mean you just encounter diplomats the whole time. Yeah. Uh, don't do something completely different. Go and do something for the Brits, you know, around the creative industries, for example. You know, I've been, I was chairing the international board of our creative industries federation. And, you know, I learned so much about the importance of that sector, hmm. which means I, f I now feel I can uh, advocate for it in a way that I yeah. couldn't, uh, before. Um, science diplomacy, I, I think one of the key things, you know, there are so many offshoots of, you know, and we, we could look into all different kinds of offshoots of diplomacy. The key thing is to work out where we, as the diplomats, add most value. And mm. it's not only finding the cure for COVID-19. Uh, mm. it, it's not going to be curing cancer. Um, it's not going to be going to Mars. Mm. But what we can do is horizon scan and spot yeah. those opportunities for yeah. connection and then make those connections and, and be the conveners, be yeah. the people who set the table and then get the right people around it. And then actually maybe step away after a couple of courses when it all gets a little bit too complicated for us. Um, yeah. So I don't think that we all need to, to be the people who understand the science inside out, but um, yeah. we can be the joiner uppers. 
I always say to the, the, the students that we, we train at the Diplomatic Academy, you know, join the dots. It's all about joining those yeah. dots uh, uh, connections. Like, uh, Tom, I, I prefer to think of it as mapping, mapping the territory, to go out there and figure out what exactly is going on in a particular country uh, in terms of, of, of scientific research, in terms of the institutions. And again, there's, there, is a, there are power structures there. There are people who will allow you access and others who won't allow you access. Uh, there are all the new companies that are popping up. There are the academic institutions, for example. Uh, and being a guide... Sorry, yeah. You have to know your own country. That You have to know those networks. You know, it's your yeah. point really well as well. I mean, there's no point in finding, in mapping all that in the other country. They're not realizing that actually it's Sharjah that is the answer to that particular partnership. Yeah. Well, it's Birmingham yeah. the answer to the other partners. You know, so you've got to be able to spot those opportunities in both directions. Yeah, and I, I think um, I, I often say this in our ministry meetings that we, we should be almost institutionalizing our relationships at, back at home um, so that when our diplomats bring back knowledge of the territory that they can actually plug into a system that will accept it as opposed to each person going out, each diplomat trying on his own to look through his own personal contacts to figure out how he or she can, can get something done. An, an embassy shouldn't be like a castle that keeps people out. It should be a connector. That's the... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I tried to get rid of my, the, the embassy building in Lebanon at one point because I felt that it was too uh, frightening to people. You know, it was, all, it was all built around keeping us safe inside. Right. Uh, harder to make the connections that uh, I wanted us to make. Well, I used to answer the question, where is your embassy? And I'd say right here, you know, where I am. Exactly. Yeah, not everybody appreciated it. <laughs> <laughs> the original embassies weren't buildings, you know, they were individuals. They were, it was they nice. were right? They, you know, so you didn't, you know, when you went out from the Venetian city-states, you, your embassy was your group of people. It was a group, you know, a group of business people and actors. It's your delegation, yeah? And I, I much prefer that idea. Uh, it's yeah. much less, but somewhere along the way, we got a little bit lost behind all the titles and the excellencies and the protocol and the, you know, the, the platitudes of you know, warm bilateral relations and so on. Well, I actually found that um, your excellent, the title Your Excellency was a, a brilliant way of remembering somebody's name. All I had to say was Your Excellency and they would recognize themselves. You know? I have a theory um, and uh, uh, maybe I shouldn't take this one too far, but that that the people who insist most on being called Your Excellency tend tend to be the people who are least excellent. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not going to be held to anything on that. I I, I know too many people in that in that sphere. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to ask another question. Uh, somebody somebody has asked, how do you deal with hate? Oh, it's quite a good one. Huh? Yeah. Like, but can, I, can I sort of expand that? Because actually, it's not just hate. I mean, there's a whole set of negative emotions in certain relationships. I mean, you know, when you said that you went to the Iranian, uh, I mean, there are relations that have a lot of tension, right? How do you, how do you turn up at the Iranian reception? Uh, and how do you take what could have been a negative experience? Wow. I, I think the first thing is to recognize that, that there is a lot of hate out there and part of our job is to go to the places where there is hate. And, and you know, yeah. you're in on this, you know, to try and bring people together, to try and create that gray zone where cultures can interact and ideas can, can interact. You don't make peace with your, uh, with your, with your enemies. You know, the one amazing Northern Ireland moment I had was when I asked this one lady at a, a conference why she was there. And she said, well, my father was killed in a, in a terrorist attack. And right. I wanted to share my story. And I said, that's, you know, Speechless, that's courageous. I said to the guy next to her, why are you here, sir? He said, I was the bomber. No. And they were going around together. You know, so they, they had, they weren't pretending the hate wasn't there. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Trying to, to take it and, and turn it into something else. And at the end of the day, you know, that, I, I know you feel this too. That's why, that's why we're in this job. It goes beyond just the national interests. It's about trying to help people to, to coexist. Yeah. That said, you know, I had some tough days in, in Lebanon where I would sit there, at the breakfast table and the first thing I would look at was the red folder with the uh, intelligence inside it. I hope that's not a state secret to say it was a red folder. Hmm. I think it's a... No, you, you've given it all away. Uh. Right, that's it. I'm going to have to kill you now, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> and, everyone else, and everyone listening. So if you'd all hand in your uh, address. <laughs> and, but anyway, you know, you open the folder and, and the first report would often be the list of the 
the characters who wanted to kill you that day. Uh, you know, and you oh, nice. when, you're in, when you're a diplomat in Lebanon, you're conscious of the sacrifices that many people have made, including you know, and are making day in day yeah. out. Yeah. From all of that, you know. Incidentally, the the smartphone that I was using to connect with people was also the device that the terrorists were using to track my movements. So it, it was it was more than a metaphor for that balance between connection and danger. Yeah. Um, and of course, you then go online and you then swim into a whole different wall of, uh, of hate. And mm. I think you have to have a thick skin. You said it earlier, you have to have a certain amount of resilience. And, and if you're online, you have to have more of that. Sadly, you know, if you're a woman online, you have to be even, even more resilient, you know, because you'll get even more of this sort of really unpleasant hate. I used to get a lot of brutal stuff from Assad uh, trolls yeah, online. Yeah. Uh, most of which I now realize were, you know, sitting in some Russian warehouse somewhere. Um, and that could get quite nasty. Uh, and, you know, m once my mum called up and said, why does everyone hate you? <laughs> and I said, don't worry, people are robots. Um, I think she not. was trolling you. <laughs> That's to do with social media. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hi, mum, if you're watching. Um, <laughs> anyways, you do have to... Uh, you, you have to you have to have a thicker skin on social yeah. media. You can't take it. Uh, you can't take it personally. Yeah, either that or a very good algorithm to weed out all those messages of hate. I think. Yeah, yeah I go for the algorithm. That's what the block button and the mute buttons are for. I, you know, I, yeah. I tend to treat the trolls like I would if, if you know if in a real meeting. If someone shouts at you the first time, you try to listen. You try to address their issues. Maybe the second time, you'd say. You know, sir, can we have a kind of more polite conversation? You know, but if the third time they're still calling you, you know, I get called a new insult every day on Twitter. I can't keep up with, I won't repeat some of the ones I, I get uh, each day, um, especially if you tweet about the Middle East. Yeah. Um, well, the third or fourth time, it's just like, you know, block, mute, that's fine. You know, in real life, you'd, you'd have them kicked out of the conversation. Are you allowed to comment on, on Lebanon now? Or uh, because there are a couple of, there are at least three questions relating to your work there. Um, you seem to have a soft spot for Lebanon. What do you make of the current wave of protests and the reaction? Oh, I mean, no, I mean, I, I you're a hardliner, as I know. I feel, I feel huge love for Lebanon. Um, yeah. it, 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 it felt like a love affair to me. I really, you know, I, it, it didn't feel like a, a, a normal posting. Um, so I can, I can comment Lebanon. I tend to try not to. Um, yeah. But partly because, you know, I'm five years out of date. Um, partly because there's a, a fantastic ambassador and embassy there at the moment, and the last thing they need is uh, an armchair ambassador uh, opining on things. But I can, huh. so I, I can try, but I might be a bit more boring than I would have been. Oh. All right, okay. Um, uh, Hind Ahmed has got a number of questions, but the one I want to hear from you is, where do you see yourself 10 years from now? Will you have finished from um, Harper College or, or will you have been uh, kind of enthroned there? <laughs> um, I will, it's a 10 year, uh, it's a 10 year assignment. Uh, you, That's you're amazing. A huge um, channel, challenge, a huge honor. Um, yeah. I have to say you, you, you're very much working for the college. So that assumes that you actually deliver the things they want you to deliver. Uh, yeah. So if I'm not there in 10 years, it's, it's probably a sign that I've <laughs> in some way. So I would hope that, you know, that we've made real progress by then and, and accelerating the effort. Hartford is this fantastic place of opportunity and yeah. it's always a, a great ladder up uh, for people in the world. It's given them a real great start in the world. I hope, it, I hope in 10 years time it will be this extraordinary hub for, for amazing research and this not incredible community. So that's my real focus. Um, yeah. I, beyond that, I, you know, I, I'd, I'd hope that there might be some diplomacy in the future in some way. Um, I hope that yeah. I haven't left the Middle East forever. Um, I'd be very sad to, you know, to feel I was never really coming back to this area. I think I would also hope to be doing more writing. Uh, as you said, I'm struggling to finish my murder novel at the moment, but um, I have another book in the works on how do we survive the 21st century, which I'm uh, getting stuck into right now. Fantastic. Uh, you know, and by that stage, my kids will be grown up. You know, I'll, I'll no longer be homeschooling, hopefully. But homeschooling is fun. I, I, love, it. We I love it. Uh, we were doing the Romans today and we've just done Joe Wick's um, uh, PE lesson. And I, 
it's been a blessing actually. Uh, th th this last three months, uh, not you know, not every minute of every day, um, but I've I've learned so much, and and to to see it through their eyes as well has, has been terrific. Somebody has asked uh, another good question, which is, if you were, if both of you were to write a book about current diplomacy, what would it be called? And I'm not allowed to use Naked Diplomacy too, it seems. <laughs> um, you should go first, because you'll sell more copies than me. I, I mean, so, <laughs> I, so you think. I'm, I'm gonna cheat actually, and just use the title of the next one I'm doing, which is 21st Century Streetcraft. Oh, okay. And because it's the, the new survival skills, and um, you know, yeah. it's the, from diplomacy in life that you can then use that you really that you actually do need in life rather than what we actually learn at school even i must admit at our little home school um and and the novel is called the zealot uh, zealot that's very really... about the number of zealots that there are in the world uh today and i think we need more people who are a little bit less zealous and are able to see two sides of an argument but it is a murder, murder novel Yes, it's about um, an Emirati diplomat um, who... <laughs> no, 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 you can't say that. No, no, that's terrible. It's actually it's set in, in, in an embassy. It's set in the British embassy in Paris. Uh, an embassy oh, okay. Very well. And the, uh, you know, familiar with diplomatic protocol, you'll know that obviously the embassy is sovereign territory. And our, yes. people know that. And the murder happens in that embassy. And so the French authorities say it's a British problem. The Brits say, give it to the French to sort out. And the poor old ambassador is in the middle trying to deal with that. But it, it's got, you know, internet anarchists and terrorists and all sorts of people in it. It's, um, it's quite cathartic writing it. Any chance that I might make a, an appearance, just even a peripheral one? Well, you're the body. Uh, that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that was the cathartic. <laughs> Do I look good? Well, you, you're quite pale. Um, <laughs> Bloated, you know, I'm assuming? Th th there's nothing like that outfit for, you know, for a knife wound. It, you know, it, it, <laughs> It works well as a factor. It's quite simple. <laughs> uh, and there is an anonymous attendee who has also knighted you. You are now Sir Tom Fletcher, by the way. But, but before we knight me, we have to hear your book. Uh, I was going to get away from that. Well, actually, I'm, I'm writing a book on exactly the same topic that you're writing. Uh, I think I'm going to finish a month before you. <laughs> Uh, no, I think, yeah, what I would write, mine would be called connecting, because I think uh, it's the most important thing. And that's how deep those connections go on both sides of, of the divide. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in, in those impossible situations of, of, you know, sort of deep, deep hatred. And I often think, isn't it amazing that on a daily basis, we're all almost exactly the same. We have exactly the same kind of problems. We have, you know, we're... Uh, consumption and ejection machines. Um, we we all pretty much engage in the same set of practices every day. So uh, it's it's just always surprising how 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 we can hate each other as though we're we're different species. I think, by the way, and this is maybe what I'd like to do in ten years' time. There is some really exciting work to be done, where social media meets diplomacy meets sort of mass psychology. Yeah, it's possible to some brilliant work that's been done already on healing the wounds of history, to use the ability that, that new technology gives us to speak to a whole population. Of course, yeah, yeah. Really deep rift. I mean, that would be really exciting diplomacy, armed with the tech. Well, can I, you, I think you know that our ambassador in, in Washington uh, just reached out to the uh, Israeli public uh, to talk about, to actually um, intervene with a good suggestion from the Emirates uh, on the Palestinian-Israeli question. Uh, and it's many, many people have misinterpreted and haven't seen it for what it is, which is actually a step to um, defend Palestinian rights, uh, at, but also to map out, uh, some, to, to make a move forward, to map out um, peace in this region. Uh, and so I think that that is precisely what you're talking about. It's really, uh, really creative. And by the way, I do think one reality of geopolitics uh, and actually one reality of the handling of COVID in large parts of the West is that there are new vacancies for diplomatic actors to really fill the space that's been, you know, we won't talk about Donald yeah. Trump now, but it's been left by the absence of American leadership, uh, for example. Yeah. And I often say to the students here, we will see many, many more peace processes led by folk, you know, who are being trained in this region, diplomats from this region. Uh, yeah. You are led by by Western diplomats in the future, and that's yeah. that's a good thing. You know, that it's great for the sort of diversity of, of peacemaking. Do you have a peace? 
Do you have a peace process? Yeah. Is there a peace process that you would fancy? I'm very interested in, in making peace between Britain and the European Union, yeah. yeah. That's, that may be even beyond your, your talents. <laughs> well, Sir Tom Fletcher, uh, we've come uh, to the end. It's 8 p.m. Uh, I know that you've been working very, very hard all day long, uh, and you have some homeschooling to get back to. Uh, I apologize to those uh, uh, questioners who, whose questions I wasn't able to ask. I, I tried to get as many in as possible. Um, but, you know, the quality of answering wasn't quite what it, we expected either, so. <laughs> I, I, uh, you would be as well, Emma, if, if, people, if people have questions we didn't get to that they want to ask on, uh, on Twitter, then I'd certainly be delighted to uh, have a crack at those. And I can only, I can only apologize, I couldn't keep up. Yeah, and, and you know, I myself am looking for more Twitter followers. So if anybody in the audience would like to follow me, please, please do so. Um, much appreciated. You'll get a personal message of thanks from me. Uh, Tom, it's really great to see you. I'm glad you survived. Um, you didn't embarrass us, thank God. Uh, no stunts pulled. And thank you so much for your valuable contribution and your insights into what it means to be a diplomat in the 21st century. Thank you so much. Thank if you have you. any... As you know, I, I've quoted your book in at least 20 countries already, and I will continue to be a huge advocate for what you wrote and, um, and what you stand for. And uh, yeah. all power to well done. Uh, Thank you very much. I'm, I'm expecting royalties for that, of course. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night. Thank Good night. you.